Thank you, first of all, for coming along today. It's so lovely to see so many of you here, and we're in for a real treat today. I've been chatting to Lord Rees, that's the last time I say it, I promise, mm -hmm. to Martin uh, yeah. all morning, mm -hmm. and it's incredible what we're going to have a, a, have a chat about today. I want to start with, I know it's breakfast, and I know we're all an optimistic bunch, I can see your faces right now. Your book that you're possibly most well known for is Our Last Century. And it was, will we survive the 21st century? So mm -hmm. start on a positive note. <laughs> Why yes. did that book need to be written? Um, well, I wrote that book about 15 years ago, and I called it our final century. Question mark. The publishers cut out the question mark. But when the Americans published it, they changed the title to our final hour. Because Americans like instant gratification <laughs> and the reverse. Um, but it was really uh, highlighting the way in which this century is special. And I'm an astronomer, so I know that the Earth has been around for 45 million centuries. But this is the first when one species, the human species, has the fate of the planet in its hands. And this is something that we need to be aware of because it's a special responsibility uh, which we are frankly not handling very well. Um, and uh, uh, just to follow up on that, um, when I uh, give talks about this, uh, people think I'm an astrologer. And uh, this is why I can make predictions. And uh, I'll tell you one anecdote that um, uh, I met, um, in fact, at Davos, um, an Indian tycoon who probably has several astrologers on his staff. And he said, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? Because I'm astronomer royal. And uh, I said, well, if she wants one, I'm the person she'd ask. <laughs> and he then asked for my predictions. And I said solemnly, stock market will fluctuate. Trouble in the Middle East and things like that. And he listened very sagely. Uh, but I then came clean and I said, I'm only a scientist, only an astronomer. And he then lost all interest in my predictions. And quite rightly so, because scientists are rather poor as forecasters. Not quite as bad as economists, but uh, <laughs> heading that way. Typical Capricorn. Um, <laughs> 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 How are we getting it, getting it wrong? There was a report out last week or the week before mm -hmm. the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental yeah. Panel of Climate uh, Change, yes. saying we are in a, in, a, in a rather dire situation now. Is that the sort of thing we were, you were discussing in your book? Um, w well, um, my old book, but let me make my new book, which is um, out just this month called On the Future, a rather pretentious title, but this is an update on all these topics and a, a few more. So this was, this, uh, it got the lead review in the Financial Times a month ago, so it's been fairly well received already. So this discusses all the things I'm going to talk about today. But I think there are two classes of problem. Um, there's the problems of what we are doing collectively to the planet because of our ever heavier footprint, because there are more of us, rising population, and we're all more demanding of energy resources. Um, and uh, that is where climate is the big concern. And maybe we can talk a bit more about the best ideas of dealing with it. But I think the problem is that it's a very hard sell for politicians because their focus is on the uh, um, local and the short term. And to get them to take seriously something which affects people a generation away and affects people in distant parts of the world more than us is very hard. So it's very hard to prioritize issues like that. And I think we've got to come up with some win-win situations, which I discuss in my book. So that's one class of a threat, uh, our collective threat of climate change, which leads to concern about extinctions, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but the other kind of threat, which I've discussed in both my books, is ever more powerful technology. The fact that we're moving into a world where even a few people can, by cyber, or biotech cause, by error or design, some disaster which cascades globally. Already we know what cyber attacks can do, and they're going to get worse. Um, but uh, bio threats are equally serious, because it's now possible to re-engineer a genome, to modify um, pathogens, to make them more virulent, more transmissible, etc. And this technology is widely available, and it's going to be almost impossible to regulate worldwide, just as impossible as regulating the drug laws or the tax laws worldwide. So that's my main concern. Uh, the fact that, uh, as I put it, the global village will have its village idiots, but they now have a global range. Just to let you know, this morning does end on a positive. 
<laughs> okay, it's, it's too late to leave. Um, <laughs> yeah. Addressing both those in turn, um, one thing that's thrown off up, often to me as a biologist and who, some, someone who studies mm. evolution yeah, yeah. And, and extinctions is, well, we go through these fluctuations in the Earth and as someone who studies the bigger picture, mm -hmm. surely we go through this on a regular basis anyway. So we'd see climate change, we see huge fluctuations mm -hmm. in, in the... Is that really as big a problem as, as, as you're making it, as I'm making it out? I think it is because uh, oh, these changes are faster than the natural ones and uh, we are um, a unique species in having the capacity to re-engineer the whole earth. So I think it is special now and, uh, and what happens does depend on us. Um, but of course the upside is that we have the capability if we wish to do something about it all and to preserve the other species but of course we're not heading in that direction. So uh, I think it is sort of unprecedented even over the um, millions of centuries of previous history. It's, we were talking in, in the green room a little while yeah. ago and it's quite apparent that we look at things from very different perspectives, <laughs> but we have the same overview in many ways. Yeah, yeah. I'm very much the macro and you're very much <laughs> the bigger picture. Mm. What we both agree on is that we are going through what we call the sixth great extinction right now. Mm -hmm. Since life on Earth, we've yeah, had mm. five major extinction events, yeah. the last of which was 66 million years ago where we lost 75% mm -hmm. of life on Earth within a few months, mm -hmm. the end of the dinosaurs. Um, and we're now going through this new sixth extinction. What will that, if, if we, first of all, will we survive this? And would, how, 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 what is the impact, the bigger picture there? Will mm -hmm. we be okay? Will we as a, as a planet be okay? Well, I think we must distinguish the planet from us because uh, I think many environmentalists feel that preserving biodiversity is important, not just because the diversity is useful for us, you know, you can get drugs from plants in the Amazon and all that, but it's got value in its own right. And to quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, if we cause mass extinction, it's the sin that future generations will least forgive us for. Because I think uh, the environment and its diversity has value in its own right. Uh, and so we should care about that, as well as, of course, its value to us. The second part of your answer, when you said technology is driving ever forwards, mm -hmm. It's one of these double-edged swords, isn't it? Technology mm. can enable us to do incredible things, but also it has the potential, as you said, for, yep. for, for quite negative yes, consequences. Yes, yes. Will it go one way or the other, do you think? Well, that's a key question, which I think we have to address and which I address in the book, because the stakes are getting higher. Uh, technology empowers us far more, bio, cyber and AI, um, and that has downsides, as well as having huge societal effects. I mean, think of the change of society induced by uh, information technology. But of course, if we look back in the past, uh, we've got to accept that uh, we couldn't live the kind of lives we do today had it not been for technology. And uh, if we think back to 1960s, um, there were doomsayers like the Club of Rome and Paul Ehrlich, who predicted mass starvation in the 70s and 80s. Now, the population is bigger than he predicted. It's now uh, doubled from three and a half billion then to seven and a half billion now, but the amount of starvation is less. And that's partly because of more advanced agriculture, so, and also better health. Um, so we've hugely benefited from technology, and we will in future. But I think we've got to ensure it's well-directed and well-controlled technology, and that's the big challenge. I guess leading on from that, a very well thought out question from my perspective is, will robots take over the world, do you think? <laughs> Um, that's a big, that, that is something that... Uh, well, you've seen the movies. Well, I have, I've seen yes, several, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, they've, uh, they, yes, all, they, they all end the same way, where yes, robots yes, take yeah, over. Yeah, yes. with, with such developments in AI and, and mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence yeah, and yeah, technology yeah. and robotics, yes. it seems inevitable that we're going to be relying upon them more. Yes. You mm. said earlier we need control. Do we have control, and what will this relationship be like with technology and humanity? Well, there is an issue of control, keeping them in a the box and uh, avoiding an AI getting control of the world through the Internet of Things, etc. So there are serious concerns, and, uh, but we have a centre in Cambridge which is involved in trying to discuss the best way to regulate these things. But I don't quite go all the way with some of these people uh, because uh, I think uh, they imagine that the robots are going to be aggressive, take over the world and then expand into space, etc. But I think that's a false analogy with um, uh, biological evolution because biological evolution favours intelligence, but also it favours aggression. Whereas what we're going to have in future from the machines is, I suppose, a secular version of intelligent design, uh, where the machines will advance, 
by being designed and helping to design new ones themselves, etc. But this won't necessarily make them aggressive, because aggression is something which uh, the organic world uh, um, features and is important for the organic world, but they won't necessarily be aggressive. So I don't worry as much as some, some people. In fact, um, uh, in preparing my book, I talked to a lot of these people, and there's a big range. Um, uh, in fact, the person who's most relaxed about this is a, a chap called Rodney Brooks. He's a roboticist at Harvard um, who invented the robots called Baxter um, and the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Um, he doesn't worry about this. He says that for generations, uh, we need to worry less about artificial intelligence than about real stupidity. And I think he's probably right, right in that. Um, but at the other extreme, uh, there's a guy called Ray Kurzweil. Uh, he's um, uh, uh, now at Google. He wrote a book called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And he thinks that uh, the machines will sort of take over. And he then wants to download uh, his brain uh, into one of these electronic machines. You know. uh, and He's worried this may not happen in his lifetime. And because of that, uh, he's one of these people who signed up to be uh, frozen when he dies and his uh, blood replaced by liquid nitrogen so he can be sort of stored and then revived in this world when he can be then uh, downloaded or uh, can merge with machines. And uh, I, I think that's going a bit far. But incidentally, um, uh, I was surprised to find that three of my academic colleagues had signed up for this so-called cryonic treatment when they die. They carry medallions uh, so that if they die, they're to be carted off and frozen in liquid nitrogen, etc. Um, two of them have paid the full whack for this. Uh, a third had paid the cut price just to have his head frozen. Um, <laughs> but I was glad to say they were all from Oxford and not from my university. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, that, that's a, a digression, but uh, there's a range of views in how likely it is that the machines will take over within this century. It's the phrase a cut price, literally, quite literally there. Thank you for that one. Um, yeah. You mentioned integration. That's something that I've heard you mention before, that our future, and I don't want to get onto the future of humanity too much just yet, yeah, but yeah, yeah. You, whilst we're here, mm -hmm. the, there is potential, you think, for an integration between us and them. Um, well, I, I'm not sure. People are talking about it, um, but I think before we have that, we're going to have the ethical issue about uh, um, using genetics to change human beings themselves. Um, of course, we know that there are these new genetic techniques which can uh, uh, remove uh, the gene for hunting, hunting disease or something like that, and that's great. And in principle, one day, it might be possible to uh, um, uh, uh, analyze the human genome and see which combination of genes is relevant to good looks or intelligence or something like that, and then synthesize a genome to optimize those properties. This is something that's being talked about. And the question is, is this ethically acceptable? Would this be a new fundamental kind of inequality if it was available only to the rich people? Uh, so that, that's the kind of issue we worry about. But I think that's going to come. And um, one, one point which uh, I make in my book is that if this happens, it'll be a real game changer because the one thing that stayed constant over the last 10,000 years at least is sort of human emotions and human character. And that's why uh, we can read the literature from the classical era two or 3,000 years ago and feel some affinity for those ancient people and uh, ancient artists. But there's no reason at all, in fact, I think there's zero chance that whatever entities dominate to a few centuries from now, will have any emotional resonance with us and our literature and our art. They may have some algorithmic understanding of us, but nothing beyond that. And so that's going to be a new, faster kind of evolution of humans. And that could be just uh, organic, just by modifying the genome um, in a way that um, you, know, you could do um, de-extinct some of uh, um, animals like mammoths and uh, Neanderthals, etc. Um, but of course, whether you can uh, link ourselves to electronic brains is a separate matter. Of course, the reason why that might be a good thing is that um, even though our brain is the most complicated thing we know in the universe, um, the um, signal processing is very slow. Um, and that's because signals between different parts of the brain go a million times slower than signals within a computer. And so there may be some physical limits to how much extra brain power we could have in some organic creature. People have written about this, as you know. 
Um, and so perhaps if we can become uh, cyborgs, that will be the next step. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Whether we like it or not, I don't know. <laughs> Do you think that we are heading on a trajectory now that it's almost impossible to change? Is it too late for reversing the effects that we've seen with plastics? We, we, the yeah. reports this week saying yeah, yeah. plastics are in. If anyone's drinking plastic water from a water bottle today, 90% mm. of plastic water bottles have microplastics in. It's in 90% of table salt we mm. have. You were uh, to show your prop. I you? was. Yes, I was okay. Using things like this. <laughs> as, thank you. Uh, like the two Ronnies here. We, uh, it's yeah. just so, so much more important to look at the world around you. And we're seeing... Yeah so much being done by mm. so many people, both on an individual mm -hmm. level and in governments. Yeah, yeah. Can we change the, the devastation that we're seeing globally? Mm. I think we can, but it'll be public opinion because uh, uh, as in the case of climate, um, these issues are long-term and they're global. And politicians um, don't think that long. I mean, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker, who may not be your favorite politician, famously said that we know what to do but we don't know how to get re-elected when we've done it. And that's a problem which faces all politicians. Um, but I think politicians do respond to their inbox and to their press. And that's why, uh, um, from experience of being a bit of an insider as well as an outsider, um, the insiders who try and advise governments on science don't have much impact because the politicians have um, lots of much more urgent things that are on their minds, but they do care about uh, public pressure. And if you look back over history, you find that most of the important changes in attitudes have been started by sort of charismatic people who've built up public uh, interest and public opinion. Uh, going back to the abolition of slavery, black power in the United States, gay rights, and all of these things and Rachel Carson as another example. Um, and uh, uh, to some extent we've had this in climate, and in fact the biggest effect in recent years on the climate was the Pope. The papal encyclical, which came out in the summer of 2015 before the uh, Paris conference, had a big effect on public opinion in uh, Latin America, Africa and East Asia, where the Pope's got a billion supporters. Um, and uh, uh, they were energized and that affected their politicians, made it easier to have a consensus. So it's got to be someone who's influential or charismatic who affects public opinion. And going back to plastics, um, I think uh, the um, David Attenborough Blue Planet 2, um, especially with the um, episode that showed the albatross coming back to feed its young and regurgitating plastics instead of the food that it was uh, supposed to be bringing back for its young. Uh, that is an iconic image, which I think has helped in the last two years to um, energize the government. I mean, even Mr. Gove is now saying we mustn't have um, uh, uh, non-reusable plastic straws and things like that. So it's um, energized the politicians. That's because lots of the public remember that iconic image which is going to be analogous in the campaign for plastics in the ocean, just like the image of the polar bear on the little ice floe has been iconic for climate change. So, so I think um, it's by these public movements um, initiated by charismatic people or uh, iconic images, which could make a difference. So I'm not too pessimistic about that. You mentioned a few times already that uh the role of politicians within this. You, mm. you, you tread a very unusual path for a, for a scientist because you are also <laughs> technically a politician as well. Mm -hmm. You're a member of the House of Lords. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. how, did, how did that come about, first of all? Mm. And what's it like to be a scientist within the, within the depths of the government? Well, I'm not within the depths, and, uh, and depths is the right word to use <laughs> about them, I must say. Um, but um, uh, I should say my, my career has been mainly a straight academic. Um, but uh, uh, I've always been act active in politics, you know, campaigning for CND when I was young and all that sort of thing. Um, but in the last 15 years, I had more opportunity because I was president of the Royal Society, which is an academy of sciences and head of a college in Cambridge and all that. And then I was um, put in the House of Lords, um, incidentally, not as a political nominee, but a system started by Tony Blair when he got rid of the hereditary, it's called People's Peers, where you have an interview and you get nominated and you're a cross-bencher with no party affiliation uh, and obviously very part-time. Uh, so I'm in, involved to that extent. Um, but um, uh, 
this gives some insight into politicians, and I think the point is they are well-intentioned in most cases, but they are overwhelmed by urgent pressures, and so it is very, very hard for them to take um, uh, these issues on board. And, of course, the other point is that most of them are international. I mean, if we are to uh, provide clean energy for the world or deal with these things, um, it's got to be done internationally. Um, national governments don't have much effect singly on these um, uh, because they have to act internationally and the global corporations have as much influence as they do. It. So, so I think that's the problem. And so my, my insight has really been how little uh, politicians can actually do really uh, with these uh, major problems. From your perspective as a scientist, though, mm -hmm. has it been, I can say interesting, I'm, I'm guessing it's been interesting, mm -hmm. has it been a useful um, thing to be a scientist within the House of Lords or within the system? Do we need more scientists within, within the industry? Um, well, I mean, I think, I think we, do, we do need a wider public awareness of science. We don't, we, we, we don't necessarily need all that many more professional scientists. Um, uh, and incidentally, when we talk about scientists, uh, I'm including engineers as well. And uh, I don't know if there are any engineers here, but uh, if there are, they will like this lovely cartoon, uh, which shows two beavers looking at a big hydroelectric dam. And one beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> uh, and, uh, 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 and that shows that the engineers are much more important than the scientists. I'm an armchair theorist. I can't do very much, whereas the engineers can do a lot. But, but uh, I think we need lots of professional engineers. Um, but I think the important thing is that most of the, well, not most, but many of the issues which we have to vote on as citizens, be it on health, energy, or environment, have a scientific component. And so we can't have a responsible debate unless everyone has at least some feel for science a feel for the big ideas and the uncertainties and some figure feeling about numbers so they can't be bamboozled too easily by slogans. So I think we do need uh, a public education. But I think scientists often moan too much. They say the public doesn't uh, take any interest in science, etc. Well, of course, um, uh, the public takes a lot of interest. I mean, I think it's amazing how interested uh, the public is in... Um, uh, apes, dinosaurs there, and even space, and my things. So there's lots of public interest, and I think we should bemoan just as much the fact that mes most people are too ignorant about the history of their country, and many couldn't find Syria or Korea on the map. So general ignorance is, of course, a uh, inhibiting factor in a proper democracy. Um, but that's why the public needs to have a feel for these scientific issues, and to respond, therefore, to campaigns. Leaping sideways a little bit again, to, as to what we were mentioning earlier, mm -hmm. um, in the current um, race where we are now, we're looking at developing manned missions to Mars and yeah. actually setting up civilizations and colonies up there. Mm. Is this something we need to do, we should be doing, or because we can? Well, I mean, of course, there are many things we can do, but uh, um, aren't doing or shouldn't do. Uh, supersonic flights, an obvious example. Um, we had the Concorde from the 1960s, um, and that went the way of the dinosaurs very quickly because there was no demand. It couldn't be justified. And uh, if we think of manned space flight, then I'm old enough to remember the uh, Apollo moon landings nearly 50 years ago. And um, uh, at that time, uh, many of us thought there would have been footprints on Mars long before today, as indeed there would have been had the momentum been maintained. But of course, um, uh, the Apollo program was funded uh, as uh, an element of superpower rivalry to beat the Russians. And 4% of the American federal budget was spent by NASA in the 60s. Uh, but when they got to the moon first, there was no particular reason, and the percentage has now dropped to 0.6%. Um, and, uh, of course, manned space flight has been limited to um, uh, orbiting just around the Earth, mainly in the space station, and it's pretty unglamorous. The space station only makes the news when the loo fails or when uh, uh, that Canadian astronaut uh, plays his guitar and sings in the space station. You know, it's, n it's not good value for money, given that it cost a 12-figure sum to produce the uh, space station and its infrastructure. Now, what about manned space flight? Um, I think one thing that's clear is that as robots get better, the practical need for people in space 
is getting less. Robots can already do a lot, and we'll have robotic fabricators that could build structures in space, huge very lightweight telescopes under zero G, maybe solar energy collectors and things like that. So there's no practical case for people. And therefore, I think that if I was an American, I would not support NASA's manned program because it's very expensive. And it's expensive because they're risk averse. They're sending up uh, civilians and uh, the 2% failure rate of a shuttle was thought unacceptable. So my view is that manned space flight should be left to uh, um, high-risk thrill-seekers who are sent into space by companies like Elon Musk's SpaceX or Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. These are companies that are wonderful technically. They've got a Silicon Valley culture and they can do things more cheap and they can accept higher risks as long as they make it clear that the people who are going are adventurers prepared to take those risks. So I think that there will be people who will uh, go into space and maybe will go to Mars, um, but some will go with one-way tickets, uh, some won't come back, but they'll be the kind of people who willingly accept those, those risks. And Elon Musk himself has said that he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. And he might, <laughs> he might succeed in, in, in that. Um, and I think we should cheer these people along. Um, but the idea of mass emigration to Mars, I think, is a dangerous delusion. And it's true that Musk supports that, and my late colleague Stephen Hawking also supported this. Um, I think it's a dangerous delusion because we've got to accept that nowhere on Mars is as habitable as the top of Everest or the South Pole. Not many want to live there. And uh, terraforming Mars is a huge problem. Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle by comparison. So it's a dangerous delusion to think that we can mess up the Earth and then go somewhere else. There's no planet B for ordinary risk-averse people. Uh, so I, th I think um, uh, the um, uh, idea of people going to space, it's going to be a sort of uh, uh, thrill and spectator sport. You know, rather like people who go, go around the world ballooning and uh, this guy who fell supersonically from a high altitude balloon. It's those sort of people who will go. And I think we'll cheer them on. And incidentally, there's one reason why I think we should cheer them on uh, very strongly, because going back to what we were talking about earlier about human enhancement and all that, um, uh, I hope that there'll be effective regulation on ethical and prudential grounds on what can be done here on Earth in those directions, but these people on Mars, they're away from the regulators, and moreover, they're ill-adapted to the environment there. They've got the opportunity, therefore, and the, and the incentive to use all the techniques of cyborg and genetic modification that will be available by the end of the century to adapt themselves. And they are the ones who will inaugurate the post-human era, because they will become a quite different species. Um, within a few centuries. And of course, uh, if they uh, um, convert themselves or download to electronic entities, the electronic entities won't need an atmosphere. They may prefer zero G. So they will perhaps not want to stay on the planet. They want to, may want to zoom off into the blue yonder. And if they're near immortal, then interstellar voyages will be no uh, challenge for them. And so that is, I see, a very long-term future for intelligence, um, not just on Earth, but beyond the Earth. So, so these crazy pioneers, people with the mindset of Sir Randolph Fiennes and people like that, you know, are prepared to take these high risks. We ought to admire them and encourage them because uh, in, the, in the huge tapestry of history spread over millions, even billions of years, they will be the pioneers of the great transition between Darwinian evolution, which... Uh, we all know about, um, and uh, a new kind of evolution, which is uh, intelligently directed. You're blowing my mind, Martin. You're absolutely... <laughs> I can't formulate well, a let's question go, let's right go, now. Let's, let's go back to the apes. <laughs> yeah, no. please, if we could. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah, tell us about the apes. But I'm going to throw a curveball yeah. now at you for yeah. this. But I, I obviously study evolution and specialise yeah, yeah, in yeah. apes and, and early yeah, yeah. humans. Yeah. This is not your area, but what sort of impact do you think that will have on us? I can't conceptualise what it would be like to be a near immortal, android, humanoid, cyborg toaster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I lost my thread there. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. What impact will that have on us as a species? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we've got to, I think we've got to realise that uh, uh, we are not the culmination of, of evolution. I think you would, you would agree with that. And 
and also uh, thinking of a scientific point of view, I'm sometimes asked about uh, what are the um, uh, limits of science, etc. And I think uh, there are probably many important aspects of science which are just beyond our human brains, just like uh, none of your apes can understand quantum theory. Um, you know, in the same way, there may be uh, important aspects of reality which are beyond us, just in that same degree. Um, and so there are lots of things we maybe never understand, and these post-humans will. But there's a very big question, of course, which is um, whether they are going to be self-aware, because this, this is a, an old philosophical question about whether consciousness is something which is an emergent property in any very complex system, or whether it's somehow peculiar to the particular kind of wet hardware in the skulls of us and apes and dogs, which uh, we do think are conscious. And uh, I think that affects very much um, our response to this scenario I've just sketched out, because um, if these entities have even deeper self-awareness and consciousness, etc., um, then perhaps we to see ourselves as a step towards something even grander. But if, on the other hand, um, they aren't conscious and aren't self-aware and are just zombies, then I think uh, this is a rather sad future because uh, uh, the wonder and mystery of the universe, uh, whether it's the part out there that I think about or the part on the ground that you think about, uh, this is something which is very important to us. And uh, we appreciate this aesthetically. Um, and if these entities don't have that appreciation, this would be a sort of sad end if the universe was full of entities that weren't aware of it. Um, this would almost seem a step backwards. So I don't know if you, how you feel about that, but I think it's very important to have some idea of the self-awareness of these things. Just like, I mean, uh, uh, you studied the extent to which these um, uh, animals are really self-aware and conscious. And we, we, you're right, we've studied self-awareness uh, right across the mm -hmm. board now in, in multiple mm -hmm. species, mm -hmm. multiple groups, everything mm -hmm. from the, the corvids, the crows, to, to primates, and chimps and... and it used to be just orangutans, but uh, um, some primates, but now it's found in others. We've seen it in, yeah. in, in dolphins and porpoises, mm -hmm. birds mm -hmm. and other mammals. Mm -hmm. Run across the board. I filmed a series last year called Hyper Evolution Rise of the Robots. And <laughs> see what side of the argument I'm on here. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. With Daniel George, who's yeah, an incredible yes. professor up in yeah. Manchester within, mm -hmm. in, in robotics. Something that struck me again and again and again is the advances are being talked about with implementing our consciousness in a bot or making conscious robotics. Mm. Should we be more focused on, or should we also be looking at ethics and, and, and robo, robo rights? I mean, does, does my toaster have rights? Or I mean, It's a silly concept mm. now, but mm. in the future, we might need to address that. Are we flagging in terms of our ethics in mm. this area? Mm. Well, I think, indeed, it is a serious issue because, I mean, if, if these robots do seem to have many hu human attributes and intelligence, then we do have to ask. I mean, because uh, we all feel that uh, uh, other human beings and even some animal species have a sort of right to uh, uh, fulfill their natural potential. So indeed, should we be concerned if our robots are sort of underemployed or bored? And that, that, that may be a real question. And that uh, is a question whose answer depends on what I just said, whether they are self-aware like us. But it, it is an ethical question, um, quite apart from the ethical question of, uh, uh, of, of, of what they're going to do for us. I mean, we, we talked about the robots looking after old people, etc. cetera. Um, I think they can do a lot of that. But uh, I personally think that if the robot is going to take over other kinds of work um, and uh, displace uh, a lot of labor force, then I'd like to see the robots and their owners taxed so as to set up huge numbers of uh, dignified jobs for human beings doing things like caring for old people. Um, because I think most of us, when we're old, uh, would rather be cared for by a real person. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I think the wisest person in this country on this topic is a woman called Margaret Bowden, who's a professor at Sussex. She's written wonderful books on this. And she makes the point that uh, it's demeaning to old people to feel that they can be looked after by a robot. And she gives the other example of um, uh, um, a child um, uh, who's, uh, whose mother reads to it a story and expresses the emotions in a story of Bambi in the woods seeing his mother die and things like that. And um, she makes the point that it's not nearly so good if a child is read a story by a robot. 
which can't sort of express and react to the emotional response of the child. And so these are areas where rich people with the choice want humans to, to look, look care for them. And we should ensure that the money earned by the robots is used to um, uh, uh, enable far more people to have that benefit. I mean, this needs higher taxation. More likely this will happen in Scandinavia than in the US or this country, I'm afraid, but this is what, what I'd like to see happen. So I looked at an article recently, mm -hmm. and it, it, it sounds like a Daily Mail article, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> sorry. The Daily Mail has improved a bit, you know, recently. <laughs> it can only go up. Um, mm. Mm. Forgot your recording. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. Mm. And one of the things is that the, 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 the big fear for a lot of people is they're going to come over here, take our jobs. But the list of three or four jobs that were at the top that will remain within the human grasp are things like being a chef or being mm. a teacher or a care worker or, yes. ironically, HR and human yes. resources. Yep. Mm. Other jobs, will, will we see lots of jobs being lost in the next decade or so? We will, but as you say, it, it's, it's not just a so-called blue-collar jobs. I mean, I think uh, uh, plumbing and gardening also are two that would be hard to replicate, whereas uh, uh, many office jobs like uh, uh, routine accountancy, routine legal work, conveyancing and things like that, um, and uh, radiography, you know, look, looking at uh, uh, x-rays to see if you've got lung cancer, I think of that kind, and maybe even surgery. Those jobs can probably be taken over by, by robots. Um, I mean, overseen by people. I mean, the, uh, the best um, is a combination of a robot and a person. And incidentally, uh, uh, we, we all know about um, the um, uh, AI which beat the world champion at Go and then at chess, uh, but Kasparov, who was, of course, beaten 20 years ago by uh, an IBM computer, he has said, I think, in his, in his book, that um, um, a, ro uh, a computer plus a person is more powerful than either separately. And I think that may remain true. So um, the, the, um, uh, the, the jobs um, which um, are going to be affected by robotics won't be 100% affected. There'll still be some room for the human beings. You'll also be happy to know that marketing, media, they're all safe as well. So <laughs> most of you are fine, OK? If not, gardening. Great one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm very interested to uh, reel back a little bit, Martin, and yeah. see how you started. This is an interview with you, so <laughs> why, how did you become a scientist? Um, well, I mean, I was interested in um, numbers and nature as a kid, and um, I was good at mathematics, and so I was sent to Cambridge to do mathematics. And I always wished I hadn't done mathematics, but had done a broader scientific um, career, because I, I knew right from the start I wasn't... Well, I may have been a nerd in my own way, but I wasn't a nerd in the same way as the fellow students who were going to be mathematicians. Um, and I wanted to think in a more synthetic and synoptic way. And uh, so when I got my degree, I thought quite seriously of being an economist, because two of my friends who'd done mathematics, um, they're now quite well-known economists, and uh, I feel I could have done the same as them. Um, but what happened was I, I uh, uh, by set of accidents, I ended up doing a PhD in a, in a group uh, which was uh, studying astrophysics in the universe and had a very charismatic PhD advisor and um, Stephen Hawking was another student, he was two years ahead of me and we had a very, very lively group. And it was a good time, this was the, uh, the mid to late 1960s when we had the first evidence of the Big Bang, uh, first evidence for black holes um, and all kinds of exciting things. And uh, I always tell any young people who are thinking of going into science go into a subject where there are new techniques or new discoveries. Otherwise, you'll be trying to solve the problems the old guys got stuck on. Whereas if things are new, then uh, you can uh, um, do something where the old people have no advantage. And that was the case in that subject. And so I, I was lucky. That's how I got started in uh, astronomy. I wasn't someone who from childhood was committed to that. But uh, I, I'm, I'm very glad I'd have done better if I'd learned more science as a student. I picked that up as I went along. But of course, the good thing about the subject is that um, although it was exciting in the late 60s when I started, if you look at the last five years, I mean, if uh, just from the newspapers, uh, there's just as much exciting stuff um, in astronomy um, uh, about the Big Bang, etc. And probably most exciting in the widest interest is um, uh, the fact that we know that uh, almost all the stars in the sky, and there are 100 billion of them in our Milky Way, have planets around them just as the sun has the Earth and the other familiar planets. And uh, there are probably a billion planets which are rather like the young Earth. 
And uh, of course, this raises a question which fascinates biologists about is there going to be life on any of those? Um, and uh, uh, we, we don't know. Because of course, at one point we, do, we don't know is how life actually got started on Earth. We understand that when in evolution from the simple life to complex life, but I, I think I'm right in saying that uh, no one really understands um, the key transition from complex chemistry to the first metabolizing, replicating system we call alive. Um, that's a really difficult subject. And so we don't know whether this was a rare fluke or was it something that would have happened elsewhere. We might understand the theory of the origin of life, but also we are looking for life elsewhere. On uh, Mars is probably not very promising now, but uh, uh, the moons of Saturn and Jupiter, ice-covered moons Enceladus and Europa, but more important of all, these planets orbiting around other stars, like the Earth, uh, we can't yet get sharp enough pictures of them to answer the question, but within 10 or 20 years, we'll have telescopes that will be able to sort of see if they've got continents and oceans and something about their atmosphere and tell us whether there's something alive, a biosphere there. Now, that will be life, not intelligent life, not the aliens of science fiction. Um, the odds against finding that um, are, I think, quite high, but nonetheless it's so fascinating that um, I, I think it's worth a bit of effort. And I chair a committee uh, for a project funded by uh, a Russian billionaire uh, who spends uh, um, $10 million a year improving the depth of the search using existing telescopes for alien life. I mean, better he should spend his money this way than on a football team or on a, <laughs> on a yacht, in my opinion. Um, and so, so this, this is very, very good. But we don't expect any great success from this, but it's worth, worth a try. Um, as to what we would, what we would see um, if we detect something, um, from what I've said earlier, I think if we detect something that's manifestly artificial, it's more likely to be something electronic um, than uh, simulating like us, because uh, uh, they're, they're the far future, and uh, if they're ahead of us, they would be that. I should say, of course, that um, although I don't think we know anything about aliens, um, I get letters from people who uh, think they do know, people who've been abducted uh, and uh, uh, met the aliens, etc. Uh, and I write back to these people. I say, um, uh, do you really think that if the aliens had made the great effort to come to the Earth, would they just have made a corn circle, met one or two well-known cranks and gone away again? It doesn't seem very likely. And I tell these people who write to me to write to each other and not write to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've still got that letter. Well, your apes are alien in a sense, aren't they? Mm. So, yeah, yeah, the best analogues we have. For exactly. How exactly. we can communicate with something which across a big culture gap. You've had a very long and illustrious career, and something that happens very often is a... It's a sense of negativity, but you don't seem that. You seem very optimistic for the future, are you? Well, I want to stay alive long enough to see what happens, certainly. But, uh, uh, I mean, I think the point is that um, there are huge opportunities, but huge, huge threats, and we've got to make sure things pan out. I mean, I think we will have a bumpy ride through the century, but there are such exciting potentialities. And, of course, uh, within science, there's so much to be discovered. We are, uh, the point about science is that um, as it advances, um, frontiers go outwards, but their periphery gets longer, and so there are more questions we can pose about things which are as yet beyond the frontier of our knowledge, and, and so the more we, we learn, the more we realise we don't know, and so I think it's very exciting to be a scientist at this time. So that, that keeps me cheerful. Good enough for me. <laughs> and finally, you said a little while ago, and I, and I love that you said this, that you were a very nerdy kid growing up and I love mm. the idea that we take ownership of being a nerd or being a geek is often using a negative connotation but look where you can end up first of all. <laughs> um, you've already said that you would tell young people to get into an area of science that's yet to be uh, fully yep. explored. What else would you advise young, young people, either going into science or not? What, what's your advice for the younger generation? Well I, I would say don't spend too much time online. I think uh, you know, it depresses me because uh, you know, I, I teach at Cambridge University and um, uh, you know, people come to Cambridge University, they're very privileged and fortunate and they're only there for three years and uh, there's so much going on and it seems to be such a waste that they spend 
time online when there's lots of real people they can interact with. And so uh, I, I deplore the fact that uh, uh, the uh, o online world and social media has become so dominant. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge benefit if you're living in isolation, but uh, if you have the privilege of being in a community like a university, it's so sad. So that's the one bit of advice which, which, which I, I did give to students because when I was head of the college. This is being live streamed as well. Ah. Straight to the internet. <laughs> okay, yes, yes. Yeah. But apart from that. So I hope one or two people are listening, but I, I hope they log out at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but, 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 uh, but I, I do seriously think that uh, um, the time spent on social media um, is probably excessive for young people. And I think psychologists are now recognizing this. And I, I read that uh, in, uh, in Silicon Valley, the great high priests of IT uh, send their own kids to schools where they're not allowed to have mobile phones, which is a, a rather interesting contrast. Mm -hmm. I think you'll all agree <laughs> in saying it's been an incredible opportunity to, to hear from someone who is, is so prevalent within both the scientific, political, and, and social media community, I'm afraid <laughs> to say. Uh, if anyone is interested, and you definitely should be, then Martin does have his new book, On the Future, which is out now, which is an incredible read. And I'd like you to all join me and give Martin a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.